An iron ball is suspended by a thread of negible map beneath a floating cylinder. So like any question, I always find it helpful to try and draw a diagram uh, which describes the situation and then put all the important information on that diagram so I don't have to look at the text anymore. So I know I've got a cylinder, and then beneath the cylinder I've got an iron ball which is suspended by a string. I'm told it has a height of 6 centimetres, a surface area 12 centimetres squared, and I'm also told the density of the cylinder. I'm also told that the cylinder is submerged by 2 centimetres, 4 centimetres above the water, 2 centimetres below the water. Area here is 12 centimetres squared, and the question I'm asked is what is the radius of the iron ball? That's the thing I want to find. So the first thing I notice is that my object is in equilibrium. It's not accelerating upwards or downwards, so by Newton's second law, that tells me that the sum of the forces must be zero. So the way that we can approach this is we can recognise that we've got two objects here. I have the styrofoam and I have the ball. The forces acting on the ball is I have a weight force, the weight of the iron ball. I also have a buoyant force. This buoyant force here of the, of the iron ball is given by the weight of the displaced fluid, the weight of the fluid that would take up the same volume as the ball. And if they're the only two forces acting on my ball, then my ball would sink. So there must be a third force, and that's going to be the tension force. Tension force arising from the string. If I look at my styrofoam, Styrofoam, well my styrofoam is less dense so I expect its weight force to be smaller. It displaces a larger amount of fluid. We can see from the diagrams the buoyant force must be greater. Buoyant force of the styrofoam, this is the weight force of the styrofoam. And we also have the tension force from the string. In this case the tension force is acting downwards. The way I could try and solve it from this diagram is to write down two sets of equations from my Newton's second law. I can use simultaneous equations and eliminate T and solve my problem that way. However, there is another way I can do this, and that is I can recognise that because this distance between the styrofoam and the ball doesn't change, this is a constant, therefore I can treat this as a composite object. And so the way I would do that using a free body diagram is I'm going to erase this free body diagram. I don't need to use this one. I'm going to use a different method where I draw a composite free body diagram. One object and all I need to do is label the external forces acting on the object. So I've got the weight force of the iron ball acting downwards, weight force styrofoam acting upwards. I've got the buoyant force from the iron and then I've got the buoyant force from the styrofoam. And because it's a composite object, I don't label any internal forces, so we don't see that tension force on that diagram, only external forces. And so the sum of those forces still has to be zero. So in order to write down Newton's second law, I need to choose a direction. I'm going to choose the upwards direction as being the positive direction. Buoyant force of the styrofoam plus the buoyant force of the iron ball minus the weight force of the iron ball minus the weight force of the styrofoam must be equal to zero. So let's just remind ourselves what the buoyant force is. So how do we get the buoyant force? We remember that the buoyant force is given by the weight of the displaced fluid. And so the buoyant force of the styrofoam here is given by the weight of the fluid that would occupy this volume here. So one way of writing weight is mass times gravity. That's your weight force. Or another way of writing mass is equal to the density times the volume. Remember, density is mass divided by volume, so mass is also density times volume. So my buoyant force uh, for the styrofoam here, I can write that as the density of the fluid, which in this case here is water, times the volume uh, of the styrofoam, which is displaced. This is the volume which is, uh, that I've hashed in here, multiplied by gravity. So rho times V is mass, times G gives me a weight force. Similarly, for the buoyant force for the ball, I need to multiply the density of water, that's the fluid that the ball is displacing, times the volume of the ball multiplied by g, and then we can write down the weight force for the ball, well that's just going to be the mass of the ball times gravity, or if we like to write this in terms of the densities and volumes, it's going to be the density of iron times the volume of the ball times g, and then for the weight of the styrofoam, it's going to be the density of the styrofoam times the whole volume of the styrofoam times g. And those things there have to all add up to be zero. So in this equation here, I haven't got the radius of the iron ball explicitly. I haven't got r in what I'm trying to find. But I do know that my I've got a ball here and that the volume of the ball is going to be given by 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I know that if I can find the volume of the ball, I can find the radius just by using simple geometry. So why don't I look at this expression here and see if I can rearrange this so that the volume of the ball is the subject. Before I 
try to collect the volume of the ball as a common factor, I'm just going to realise that G appears in each one of these terms. So in fact, I can divide by G on both sides. 0 divided by G is 0. G's all cancel out. So this is simplifying things as, as I go. I want to make the volume of the ball the subject, so I'm going to factorise that out because it appears in two terms. I've got the density of water minus the density of iron. And at the same time, I'm also going to take the other two terms, this term here and this term here, across to the left-hand side. So I can put an equal sign here. Um, I'll take the negative one across to start with, so I add it to both sides. So I've got the density of the styrofoam times the volume of the styrofoam. And then subtracting off this term here, I have the density of water times the volume of the styrofoam that's displaced. That's the volume of styrofoam under the water. And then finally, I can write down the volume of the ball. It's going to be given by uh, the density of the styrofoam, volume of styrofoam, density of water, volume of displaced styrofoam, and then I can divide that by the difference between the density of water minus the density of iron. And this thing here is going to be equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. So now we should go through and try and evaluate this, uh, this term here. So the volume of the ball is given by the density of the styrofoam, which we're told is 0 0.3 uh, grams per centimetre cubed, so it's 0 0.3. If I multiply by the volume here, making sure it's in the same units, uh, we want that to be in centimetres cubed. So, so the volume of the styrofoam is given by the area times the height, so it's 12 times 6. Uh, so that's going to be 72 minus... The density of water, we can look up, uh, you might remember that it's a thousand kilograms per metre cubed, which actually is one gram per centimetre cubed, so that's one there, times by the volume of the styrofoam, which is displaced. So this is once again the height underneath the water, which is 2 times 12, which is 24. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. Okay, so we now have on the bottom here the density of water, which is 1 minus the density of iron. So that's something we'll have to look up in our textbook. It's a known quantity and that density is 7.9 grams per centimetre cubed. Putting these in our calculator yields a volume of 0 0.35 and that's actually going to be in centimetres cubed. That's the volume. We haven't found the radius yet, but we remember that the volume can be related to the radius using geometry here. So I'll just dock over this side. So rearranging to make the radius the subject of the equation, we can multiply by 3, divide by 4 pi, times by the volume of the ball, and then to get rid of the cube, we take, need to take the cube root. So we can put those numbers into our calculator to find the radius, and this will be a radius will be in centimetres. And that gives 0 0.437 centimetres as the radius. So let's quickly check this by changing one of the parameters of the system. So let's say that my density increases. Rather than having an iron ball, I'm going to have a uranium ball. But the system still stays in the same. That is, it still is the styrofoam is still submerged by 2 centimetres. That means this equation still holds. The system is still in equilibrium. Uh, so if my density increases, that's this term here, gets larger, then my denominator becomes a bigger number. That means my volume of my ball must decrease, and therefore my, I have a smaller ball if I have a bigger, bigger density. That makes sense. Now if you understand the concepts, then I invite you to try problem 51 uh, in chapter 15, which will really help you consolidate your understanding of the buoyant force, and how to apply this to a composite system.